this diary. I said, oh my God, I'd love to see the manuscript and I'll give you full credit. And somehow or another, it, it never happened. And I never got a hold of it. And I'm looking at it being published today. And I said, I just, that's what I wanted is, is diary evidence. I had, you know, uh, Yad Vashem interviews, but the earliest of them are 40 years after the fact. And, they're, and they oh, were wow. mostly with people who were, you know, say median age of 15 at the time of the events. And right. they're talking 40, 50, 60 years later. So it, it was better than not having any eyewitness testimony, but a diary was, you know, that's like the gold standard. That, that's what I would have loved. And here, all right, there's always going to be things that come out after you finish exactly. research. It, you know, it's just, that's like, you can't do anything about it. Um, two technical things. One is, um, this has yet to happen to me during a lecture, but I always say at the beginning, just in case, if I suddenly vanish because my modem has gone down, um, since I replaced my modem, I haven't had this happen, but it used to happen with the old modem, so I still say it. I will reset it and be back in a minute. Okay, and the other thing is you're going to look at the how are how do people put in the questions? Oh dear, you froze again. This is this is a problem. This is a sec. Are you there? Hello. I'm hardwired hard in. If you don't hear me. Uh, now I hear you. You froze for a couple of seconds. Yeah, but if that's happening, maybe. Is it uh, happening now, it... or we'll no. we'll see if it happens again. Because I just went back to the hard wire, so hopefully that should be okay. Okay, so um, the Q and A is going to be done how? Okay, so there are different ways. I must. Do you want questions during your talk? I'd prefer not. Okay, so I will tell people they can put Q, uh, questions into the Q and A or into the chat, and I will look at them. But unless it's something direly urgent, I will save it till the end. Um, yeah. They will be invited to open their cameras and microphones after your talk. Um, and so they can either ask you themselves or I'll read off questions. It depends okay. on our audience. Okay. But you, yeah, you don't need to monitor anything. <laughs> okay. Okay, good. Because it's... No, it's too distracting. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. I mean, uh, this whole thing that we're living on the computer screen is too distracting because <laughs> there's, you know... I always say that, you know, in the pre-computer days, my, my typewriter didn't also have my refrigerator and my mailbox inside of it. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, it was only a typewriter, right? It, like, it, it stared at me asking for me to type. Now, you know, my computer is constantly offering me distractions. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. My husband says, I have no idea how you do it because I'm sitting there WhatsApping somebody while I'm doing some research while I'm, you know. <laughs> I don't, I don't think it's good for us, but that's, you know, I... But it's what we have, unless we sit there, right? Sometimes you just have to go to a park and take your computer so you don't have any internet. And yes. Do what you need I to went do. through a period of two years when the only way that I could write my columns, you know, the, as, as a columnist, was to go and sit in a cafe with a notebook and a pen. That's Without really old school. <laughs> well, I had no idea of how many words I was writing. I actually did because I had this sort of approximate idea of how many words I put on, on one page of my notebook. But then it was the only thing there. I said, I'll find the links when I type it in instead of searching for the links while I'm writing. I'll just write. And it worked. It worked, you know, like all these sort of writer's tricks are, you know, eventually burn themselves out. But it was a good break from the from the you need uh, it. yeah i keep saying i need to do that for this book i'm writing and hasn't happened yet on? though it's a historical fiction now mm. the, the book that i'm part that i'm editing should be out god willing in june <laughs> on moroccan jews oh, um, cool. but no this is a historical fiction and i've been writing it for like 20 years already you know <laughs> it's well, one of those yeah I do use this, um, I now use this writing app called uh, Scribner, which mm -hmm. allows you to 
set up your screen so it just looks like a white page without any of the other things appearing on it. The problem with that is that I know that really hiding behind exactly. that white page is my Twitter account and, you know, um, yep. <laughs> as I said, the refrigerator and the mailbox are built into my typewriter, so. Yep, and part of your job is to monitor and part of my job is to also monitor different parts. <laughs> so, you know, you, you got a shout out, if you see, from Joe Harlap. <laughs> no, but you wrote Wait. to all panelists. That's the problem. Oh. Everybody has to open it. You have to write to all panelists and, and attendees or... Right. Um, I, I'm not going to type anything further because um, actually this is sitting on a music, this computer is sitting on a music uh, uh, um, stand, you know, stand to put your music on while you're playing a tune. Oh dear, you froze again. Either you froze or I froze. Everybody come back in and we're going to see if we can switch this before it starts.
I sincerely apologize to you. Um, we see you, but uh, you're in slow motion and your voice is garbled. This is what happened. I truly this has never happened. This is still on my phone because my internet is. Okay, folks, um, I apologize for the technical difficulties. Our moderator is apparently having uh, internet problems. 
So um, we will start this in a slightly less formal fashion than we normally would. Just one moment, there's something that I need to take care of here. Um, my name is Gershom Gornberg. I'm the author most recently of War of Shadows. It's an honor to be with you here today. Uh, I ask that questions go into the Q&A and uh, either our moderator or I will look at them after the formal part of the talk. And with that, I'm going to share a screen and uh, begin the formal lecture. And I hope that you can all see the um, slideshow as well as me. Um, when I started working on this book, War of Shadows, I told people that I was writing about the war in the Middle East. And I got quizzical looks, especially when I was in the States, when I said this, people would say to me, which war? Uh, the Gulf War, the Civil War in Syria, uh, Six Day War, and I said, World War II. And then more often than I would have expected, the looks became even more quizzical. And it underlined for me something which uh, was surprising, which perhaps some of you have also experienced, which is that American memory of the war against Germany tends to leap from Pearl Harbor to D-Day to We Won. And yet for three years, more than half of World War II, North Africa was where British and then allied forces fought Italy and Germany. And I could say more widely the Mediterranean to take in the brief period of fighting in Greece as well. And more than that, the war in the Middle East is also a key part of Holocaust history that's often left out of Jewish memory, the standard or one of the standard El Malay Rachamim memorial prayers uh, for victims of the Holocaust asks that the God of mercy give rest to the fallen of the Holocaust in Europe, which fits a near universal picture of the Holocaust being something that happened exclusively in Europe. And yet, if the Holocaust includes the Nazis' plans for mass murder, that's certainly untrue. If it includes death as a result of Nazism and fascism, to say it's only in Europe is to erase uh, to erase victims. Beyond that, what links the Jewish history and the general history of the war in North Africa is that the real story of the decisive battle, which prevented a Nazi conquest of Egypt, Palestine, and the entire Middle East, is the story of a uh, intelligence breakthrough, which is either missing or fragmentary in accounts of the war. So there's all sorts of uh, lacuna, empty spaces in the way that this is uh, that this is remembered. To understand this better, I want to take you on time travel, and this is one of those guided tours that hops from one landmark to another, and in this case, also from one place in time to another. So please stay with me. Our first stop will be central Cairo on the 1st of July, 1942. And if you're standing on the street among those department stores and apartment buildings and cafes of a city that was built to be the Paris of the Middle East, if you look toward the West, toward the Nile, what you will see is pillars of smoke rising from British general headquarters at the Middle East, from the British embassy, from RAF headquarters because clerks and soldiers are burning papers and the fires are so hot that some of the documents don't burn and the heat carries secret documents out over the city. On that morning, the 1st of July, 1942, a British code officer named June Watkins got off her shift uh, in the RAF code room of which was in the basement of a downtown Cairo hotel. And out on the street, she runs into a South African officer that she knows who takes her to the officer's favorite hangout in Cairo, Gropi's Garden Cafe for coffee. But the garden part of the cafe is closed. They have to drink their coffee inside. So June goes down to the ladies room and looks out through the window at the garden. And what she sees there are waiters are painting signs in German 
to greet the officers of Erwin Rommel's Axis Army. If you went to the train station that day in Cairo, as throngs of people did, it looked like that scene in the movie Casablanca of the Paris train station on the eve of the German conquest. It's packed with people fleeing south to Sudan are trying to get onto the overnight train east to Palestine. The British army reserves seats on the uh, Palestine trains for 1600 civilians who are in particular danger in the case of a, of a uh, German conquest because they've worked in one way or another for the British authorities. But the uh, British authorities in Palestine don't want to let in the 100 Italian and German Jews who are on that list because the British white paper uh, is strictly limiting Jewish immigration to Palestine. The Turkish embassy in Cairo sends a radiogram to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Ankara and says um, there's an increasing number of Egyptian Jews who want visas for Turkey. Uh, what are we supposed to do about this? And the answer comes back by radio from Ankara to the Turkish ambassador in Cairo saying, do not give them visas. Do not let these refugees come here. We're reading these telegrams in, in English, not in Turkish. The reason for that is that they were picked up, intercepted uh, by British wireless operators and decoded and translated by GCHQ, the government communications headquarters, the British agency whose very existence was unknown to the public and was responsible for signal intelligence for intercepting enemy messages. If you saw the film, The Imitation Game, you saw a highly inaccurate version of how GCHQ broke Enigma. It also broke the diplomatic codes of two dozen countries, by the way, including US diplomatic codes and including Turkish codes. Everyone knew that day that Cairo faced the same fate, fate as Paris or Belgrade or any of the other cities that had been conquered by the Axis. And the reason that they thought that this was what was about to happen can be seen on the map. 10 days earlier, the Axis army, the German and Italian army, army under Rommel had conquered the small port city of Tobruk in Eastern Libya, in what was known as Kyrenaica, the Eastern province of Libya. And the British army appeared to collapse at this point. In the next 10 days, Rommel advanced 350 miles to a spot in the Egyptian desert on the coast called El Alamein. Let's stop for a second and talk about Rommel. That's Erwin Rommel. Uh, he was the most famous of the German generals. He, after his time in North Africa, wrote a memoir of that period, which he entitled War Without Hate, he describes the, the war just as soldiers essentially in a deadly game. This completely ignored the civilians uh, who actually lived in North Africa. A post-war story grew up around Rommel that he was a good German. In part, this was encouraged by the fact that he committed suicide after he allegedly, and I stress the word allegedly, took part in a coup attempt against Hitler in 1944. So hold on to that name, Rommel. But we're still in the summer of 1942. And the fact is that Palestine is an extremely uncertain refuge. And again, the map gives you an idea of why, because the distance from El Alamein, from, from Tobruk to El Alamein and the distance from El Alamein to Jerusalem are virtually the same. Among the Jews in Palestine, in Eretz Israel, the expectation is simply that Rommel is coming. This is incredibly frightening, but the meaning is also unclear, uh, much less clear than, than we might think in hindsight. On the one hand, there had been a report in late June from London based on information that had been smuggled out of occupied Poland and given to the Polish government in exile that over 700,000 Jews had been murdered in, in Poland, uh, some of them in mobile gas chambers, essentially trucks turned into gas chambers. Um, with information from elsewhere, three days after this, at the end of June 1942, the World Jewish Congress publicizes that one million Jews have been murdered in occupied Europe. This is how the item appeared 
in the New York Times on page seven next to the uh, Saks Fifth Avenue ads. Before you think that this is the Times ignoring uh, what's happening to the Jews, uh, they, the, the Times editors were not alone in, in having doubts about the report. The same day in the Hebrew newspaper Hatzofet in Tel Aviv, an editorial was published casting doubts on the figures coming from Europe. It says, these items come as rumors taken from the air, passed from one informant to another, one writer to another. The, the newspaper says it's basically irresponsible that everybody is republishing these reports because we don't really know what's happened and this is surely exaggerated. What the Jews in Egypt and in Palestine do not know is that the SS is confident of Rommel's victory. In fact, it is so confident that it has set up an Einsatzkommando, a mobile killing team for the Middle East. The same day, July 1st, 1942, the commander is appointed for that Einsatz group, uh, Einsatzkommando. His name is Walter Rauf. He's a senior SS uh, officer. And in fact, he is the man who was responsible for the produ production of those mobile gas chambers. His orders are to carry out executive measures, which is to say mass murder against the Jews of Egypt. And once Rommel advances, as everyone in, in uh, the German military expected, the targets would be the Jews of Palestine of Eretz Israel. And if Rommel realizes his plans to advance to the Iraqi oil fields, the 25,000 Jews of Syria and Lebanon and the 100,000 in Iraq will also be his targets. To understand what happened next at Al Alamein, we need to travel in time again, to go back nearly three years to the first week of the war of September 1939 to the train tracks of Poland. And we're gonna look at two trains, one entering and one leaving Poland. The first train uh, left Berlin on the 3rd of September, 1939, two days after the German invasion of Poland and it's headed east into Poland it's Hitler's private train. He wants to see his army involved in conquest and in charge of his security is his favorite general, Erwin Rommel. Rommel proudly writes to his wife that he'd been invited to sit next to Hitler at lunch and that he, Rommel, quote, was allowed to chat for almost two hours, unquote, with Hitler about military problems. Rommel writes, he is extraordinarily friendly towards me. Rommel, in fact, worships Hitler. Exactly at the same time, that first week of, of September 1939, the head of the SS and the Gestapo, Reinhard Heydrich, tells the German military intelligence in chief, chief, Wilhelm Canaris, quote, the nobility, the Catholic church, clergy, and the Jews of Poland must be killed. And we have similar testimony of Nazi plans from an officer who served under General Franz Halder, the chief of the army, uh, German army staff. This officer wrote in his journal, that some of what he heard from Halder was too awful to write down. So I leave it to you to think about whether Rommel did or did not know the meaning of German victories. But Rommel was busy being elated by the invasion of Poland. It fit his idea of how war should be fought, rapid warfare, armored divisions breaking through enemy defenses. The thing is that for this kind of new warfare called Blitzkrieg, Tanks were not the only machines that were needed. Headquarters needed to be in direct touch with the commanders of the tank forces who needed to be in contact with the units under them. And the only way to do that was by radio, but sending battle plans by radio is to shout them out to the world. The solution to this problem that the Germans found was a machine that was put on the market by a Berlin company in the early 1920s for business use, a machine called the Enigma. Uh, it was portable, it scrambled messages. To decipher a message that had been scrambled by Enigma, you needed another Enigma machine with the same wiring set up to the same starting positions. The thing is that the number of possible starting positions was 150 quintillion. Uh, and that's the small number because the number of ways to wire the machine was a number equal to five followed by 92 zeros. It was totally obvious that no one could ever test this many combinations, that there was no mathematical solution to Enigma encryption, that this was, to use a term that's common today, unbreakable or completely secure encryption. 
But I mentioned two trains. The second train left Warsaw, also heading east, away from the German forces on September 6, 1939. And on board was the man who can be said to ultimately have defeated Rommel. His name was Marian Rajewski. He was 34 years old. Ten years earlier, while he was working on his master's degree in mathematics at a Polish university, he was recruited by Polish military intelligence's cipher bureau, uh, the secret agency responsible for breaking codes. And in the autumn of 1932, he was assigned to break Enigma. By January of 1933, in less than three months, he figured out the wiring. He solved the problem of five followed by 92 zeros. He and two assistants then found ways to figure out the settings uh, that the German military was using on the machine. But as war approached, the Germans were changing their settings daily. Ryuski and his two assistants couldn't keep up. And in July of 1939, they invited two British codebreakers, cryptologists from Britain's ultra secret GCHQ government communication headquarters to come to Warsaw and they shared their work. In September of 1939, as the German invasion began, Ryuski escaped Warsaw via Romania and he reached France where he continued to advise the British. In fact, all British work breaking the Enigma cipher during World War II was based on Ryuski's incredible mathematical breakthroughs before the war. Uh, we're gonna travel in time and place again. Actually, we're gonna stay at the same date, but a different place. While Ryuski is fleeing, GCHQ settles into its new location, an estate called Bletchley Park, which is a hideous mansion on the rail line between Oxford and Cambridge in the British countryside. And among the people moving in there, the genius is working for GCHQ. There's Alan Turing, a Cambridge mathematician. Based on Ryuski's work, he designed a giant machine that could run through Enigma settings looking for the one that could have produced a particular text. Uh, also at Bletchley Park was another Cambridge mathematician named Gordon Welchman, an ethereal academic. Besides figuring out the change in wiring that would make Turing's machine actually work, Welchman's really big idea was that code breaking wasn't academic work. It wasn't something for a genius alone in a small room. He proposed turning code breaking into an industry, dividing research on new codes from the daily code breaking, three shifts a day of code breakers. Bletchley Park goes from a small team of about 100 people when the war started to thousands of people working there by the end. It was essentially a high tech startup before that term existed. Okay, we're gonna make another jump in time and space. We're going to go to North Africa on the border of a Egypt and Libya, and it's the autumn of 1940, the autumn of 1940. This is the point at which, after months of indecision, Italian dictator Benito Mussolini decides to go to war on Germany's side. His goal is to realize his dream of a new Roman Empire, which will include Egypt. And in September of 1940, uh, the blue line Italy invades Egypt from its colony of Libya. From this point, the Mediterranean and especially North Africa is the main front on which Britain and its dominions fight the Axis. The British counterattack in December of 1940, they take all of Eastern Libya, Cyrenaica. Uh, Italy is reeling. In February of 1941, Hitler decides that he has to intervene in Libya before the Italians lose the whole country, and the British can threaten occupied Europe from the south. So Hitler's decision is that he sends Rommel to Africa with two German divisions. Rommel attacks, he retakes Benghazi and most of eastern Libya, and then the same pattern repeats itself in the fall of 1941 and the beginning of 1942. The British attack, they take Kiraneica, and then Rommel turns around and reconquers most of it, including Benghazi. Looking at these defeats, Mussolini comes up with an anti-Semitic explanation. It must be the fault of the Jews. Why else would Italy be losing? So he issues a decree in February of 1942 to expel all of the Jews of Libya to concentration camps, starting with those in Eastern Libya and Kiraneica. Uh, there are roundups in different towns. Um, Jews are put on trucks for a five-day journey to a 
concentration camp in the West called Jado. The roundup goes slowly because trucks are desperately needed to supply arms and fuel to the Axis army. And yet some of these trucks, nonetheless, despite the military situation, are used for taking Jews to the concentration camp. In Jado, the Jews live on a diet of 100 to 150 grams of bread a day. Uh, they're subjected to forced labor. At one point, when some of them work up the courage to ask the commander for more food, the commander says to them, we didn't bring you here to keep you alive. We just didn't want to waste bullets on you. And in fact, in the end, a fifth of the Jews who were sent to Jada would die either of disease or of hunger. Let's travel again. We're going to go to spring 1941 to the far east of the Middle Eastern Front, to Baghdad, where four pro-German Iraqi colonels carry out a coup. The ruler of Iraq, the regent who's filling in for the seven-year-old king of Iraq, uh, flees Baghdad, and Bletchley Park's codebreakers, wireless operators, pick up a stream of German messages showing Nazi support for the new government in Iraq. Um, the German Air Force is sending bombers, fighters, and transport planes from Athens and Rhodes in occupied Greece with Iraqi markings or no markings at all. In Iraq, the radio is full of constant pro-Nazi propaganda. Uh, there's free reign is given to pro-Nazi youth movements to attack Jews. Britain decides that it cannot afford to lose Iraq and uh, sends a force to invade Iraq. The Iraq Iraqi army collapses and the regent, the fill-in for the king, returns to Baghdad on the 1st of June, 1941, which happened to also be the first day of the holiday of Shavuot. Baghdad at this time, I should point out, was one-sixth Jewish. Baghdad in 1941 is as Jewish, say, as New York City today. Jews come out in their holiday best to greet the regent and Iraqi soldiers and a mob attacks the Jews. This is a report from afterwards <clears throat> uh, from the British ambassador in Baghdad. He describes shooting, looting and rioting. And over the course of the next two days, several hundred Jews are brutally murdered in the streets of Baghdad until the regent finally orders the police to stop the rioting. This was known in Iraqi Jewish Arabic as the Farhud, the looting, and the victims, the Jews who died in the Farhud may be the least known and least acknowledged victims of Nazism. Look at the pattern that is going on here. The first thing is the Axis aspiration is to control the entire Middle East. And wherever Axis governments directly or indirectly are in power, there is an immediate threat to the safety and the lives of the Jews. We're gonna get back on our time machine. We're going back to Bletchley Park. It's April, 1942. Gordon Welchman's team is finally breaking into the Enigma networks, the highly coded networks of messages used between Berlin and Rommel's headquarters in Africa. And this message is decoded. It's reported from a good source that the British will not be ready for an offensive in Libya before June 1st. This is incredible intelligence for Rommel. It tells him that he has until the beginning of June to preempt the British by attacking himself. This message is sent to the desk of a 24-year-old woman named Margaret Story, who had been recruited two years before for Bletchley Park at the rank of untrained clerk. Joining Bletchley Park transformed her life. By spring 1942, uh, she's made into a research specialist who's in charge of finding evidence of enemy intelligence in Enigma messages. I'm sorry that I can't show you a picture of her. Uh, she left almost no trace in her life but her work. It took me many months to find people who had known her. They told me, picture her as a slight woman who always wore dark cardigans, who was always smoking, who was self-effacing, introspective, very intelligent, who had a daunting intelligence, who had absolutely formidable intelligence, who was shy, very shy, who was the brain, who spoke nine languages. Well, more messages follow, quoting the good source. This is one of Margaret Story's reports. The good source in Cairo, whoever or whatever it is, is giving away British positions, plans, and mistakes. Ramos' supposed ESP, his ability to figure out exactly what the British had planned, is actually the best intelligence source the Axis have had during the war. And so Margaret Story 
and the others at Bletchley Park need to know who or what is the good source. How do we stop it? In retrospect, the suspects would have included, well, first of all, the possibility that a German spy or spies had been brought to Egypt by the famous Hungarian desert explorer, Laszlo Almasi, who has now become a German intelligence officer. He was turned into a romantic and highly inaccurate fictional character in the uh, novel and film, The English Patient. Or there's the possibility that the source is King Farouk of Egypt or somebody near him. Farouk is 22 years old. His pro-axis leanings are well known. He in fact had learned in advance of the British invasion of Persia in 1941 and warned Germany. Or perhaps the Axis has a British code that was stolen from an embassy before the war. In, uh, in 1937, Major Valentine Vivian, the deputy head of MI6, of, of Britain's spy agency, had visited the British embassy in Berlin and wrote a scathing report of the incredibly poor security there that could allow the Gestapo to break in and steal documents, documents that might have included code books. So who was the good source? I'm going to leave that for the book, uh, not to tell everything at one time, but let's jump forward in time once again to June 21st, 1942. Rommel has just taken Tobruk. His orders are to advance to the Egyptian border and stop, but then he gets a message from the good source in Cairo. And it says, if Rommel intends to take the Nile Delta, this is a suitable moment. The British are in disarray. This is the opportunity. Rommel is like a gambler who just got an inside tip. He invades Egypt. He needs to get to Alexandria to have a port to receive supplies. He needs to get beyond that to Palestine to take the RAF bases, the Royal Air Forces bases from which planes would take off to, uh, to attack ships coming to Alexandria. The good source, tells him that the British army will mount its final defense at a place called Mersa Matruch along the coast of Egypt. By a careful comparison of allied and Axis intelligence documents, including ones that I found by locating the descendant of a key officer, I discovered that it was precisely at this moment that the British succeeded in silencing the good source. Again, exactly how you can read about in War of Shadows. But on June 25th, General Cloud Auchinleck, the head of Britain's Middle East Command, changed the defensive plan. He decided that Brit Britain's uh, defensive line would be built stretching into the desert from El Alamein. The reason for that is that this is the narrowest point between the coast and the cliffs dropping into something known as the Qatar Depression. At this point, Rommel might try to break through the British line, but he cannot sweep through the desert around it. Uh, there's no way to outflank the British defense. But there's no longer any good source intelligence from Cairo. Rommel is clueless of this critical change. By June 30th, he's convinced that he's on his way to Alexandria. His medical officer is already issuing instructions for the troops that telling them not to drink unboiled water in, in Egyptian cities and not to buy ice cream on the streets. Um, on the 1st of July, when Rommel reaches El Alamein, his orders to his, uh, to his forces talk about the fact that they're just going to mop up the strong point at El Alamein. They don't realize that they're facing a major British defense there. All of these messages are being broken at Bletchley Park and passed on to the British commanders in Egypt. The source, the good source has led Rommel into Egypt and suddenly become silent at the precise moment that it left him blind to British defensive plans. Instead of breaking through at El Alamein, after weeks of fighting, Rommel can't advance. His supply lines are stretched back to Libya. For all practical purposes, El Alamein was not just figuratively, but literally the line in the sand where the British stopped Rommel's army. It took until November until another British commander, Bernard Montgomery, actually drove the Axis forces back. Churchill would call that the end of the beginning of the war, the turning point in the war, but the real end of the beginning was July when Rommel failed to break through. Once he was stopped short of Alexandria, Rommel's army was doomed because of the difficulty in supplying it. 
the victory in the secret war, in the intelligence war, was the key to the victory at El Alamein. Rommel never reached Alexandria. Walter Rauf and his Einsatzkommando never reached Cairo or Tel Aviv. Neither of them would ever know of the role of Ryuski, Welchman, Turing, or Margaret Story in their defeat. Nor would the Jews of the Middle East know that an access good source led Rommel to El Alamein and that silencing that sort, source at the last moment is what had saved them. I'll um, finish up with just a few closing thoughts to tie this all together. The Nazis not only intended, but actively took steps to extend the genocide of the Jews to the Middle East. The Jews who died at the hand of the, of the, uh, of the Axis, uh, of the Germans and their allies in Tunisia, Libya, Iraq, were victims of the Holocaust. Their numbers were smaller, much smaller than in Europe, but they are part of the larger picture. Each individual is a whole world and we should not forget them. And finally, were it not for the covert victory in the shadow war, the overt victory at El Alamein, the SS would have reached Egypt, Palestine, and perhaps beyond them. So we owe a debt to the forgotten heroes who stopped the Nazis, and we have an obligation to remember the victims beyond Europe, and the full story you can find in War of Shadows. Uh, Thank you very much. And I think that Dora is back to handle the uh, to handle yes. the questions. So first I have to sincerely apologize to everyone. Uh, this is the, I got a new modem to update everything. And of course that didn't help. So I wanted to say at the beginning how much I enjoyed looking through the book and reading parts of it. And just, it's an actual story. I know now you gave a lot of the details cause I got to see the end of it. But um, I want everyone to know who's watching that it really reads like a story. It reads, it's, it's very a readable book. So it's quite exciting. And I don't know if you um, introduced yourself yet or not. So I'll just give a bit basic overview of who you are in case you didn't. Gershom Gorenberg is an Israeli historian and journalist. He's a columnist for the Washington Post and has written for the New York Times Magazine, Atlantic Monthly, and the New York Review of Books and in Hebrew for Haaretz. Um, and as you can tell, he is an engaging speaker as well. So thank you. And thank you for sharing all that information. And again, I apologize to everyone. I do want to open up so that if anybody has questions, you may definitely open your cameras and open your microphones. So you'll be able to do that. Um, we do have a first comment from Jennifer. Uh, I started reading your book several weeks ago, and the story unfolds much like Leon Uris's Exodus with the different actors all getting their due. Was that intentional? Were there other writers, whether historians or not, who inspired you? Uh, well, I will say, first of all, that my basic philosophy in writing history is that history should be written like a novel in which all the details are true, that the model should be literature, should be telling a story. History is a great story. It's exciting. It should, it should read like that. It's not, it's not dry. Uh, among the writers who I specifically could tell you I see as, as being models of that are uh, Lapierre and, and Collins in uh, O Jerusalem, um, Tom Segev's book One Palestine Complete, um, Taylor Branch's three volume uh, biography of Martin Luther King, Rick Perlstein's books on the rise of American conservatism, starting with Before the Storm and most recently Reagan Land. What I share with those writers is the belief that history should be written as a good story. Excellent. And like I said, I really thought it was written as a good story, so thank you. A very important question is where can I buy the book? And I've seen it on Amazon. Is there somewhere else you'd prefer that they buy it? Well. I prefer that you buy it, but I don't have mm -hmm. any, um, I am not obligated to any one uh, uh, bookseller. I've just put in the chat a link to the publisher's page, and from there you can get to any of your favorite, uh, whatever your favorite bookseller is, whether it's one of the big chains or, or an independent one. 
And I should also note that the book is available in audiobook if you prefer to listen rather than to read. Okay. Again, I do encourage everyone to open your cameras so that it's more of a discussion and we can ask questions in person. I um, also need to give a thank you to Rabbi Dr. Um, Chaim Angel for uh, introducing us to you. So to Gershom, so thank you. You can all thank him as well if you ever see him. Um, so putting that out there. Uh, Paula did write in, you are understandably quiet on who the good source was. Um, we're assuming that's intentional unless you wanna tell a little more. Well, I, I, yes, that was intentional. This is a story. It's a spy story. Um, and, uh, you know, when you talk about a story, you don't want to give away all the spoilers. I want to <laughs> leave you the fun of reading the book and uh, seeing if you can figure out as you go along who the good source is. I can only tell you that it took a very, very long time and an incredible intelligence effort, intelligence in both meanings of the word, for uh, the people at Bletchley Park at GCHQ first of all, to figure out who the good source was and then to silence the good source. And the timing at which the good source was silenced, as I said earlier, is absolutely astounding. No British intelligence officer or general would have ever dared to deliberately lure Rommel all the way virtually to the gates of Alexandria just to stretch out his supply lines and defeat him. But that's what ended up happening because of the way that the intelligence battle went. First, Rommel's source led him into Egypt, then it essentially abandoned him so that he lost his ability to see what the British were, were going to do. Um, that's luck. That's, uh, I don't know, divine intervention, however you want to read it, but it's an extraordinary miracle. Joe, your microphone was open first. So did you have a question? I just wanted to, first of all, I can't wait to start reading it. My, <laughs> my fingers are itching to open the pages. And uh, thank you, Gershom, for a very interesting intro. Um, and hopefully I'd like to get uh, to meet you one of these days. I'm a, I'm a journalist as well. Um, is, is the book available locally, uh, like Stymatsky or Sonic uh, I, I, I have to admit that in pandemic times, I haven't spent very much time in bookstores, so I can't tell you, but my best advice for ordering it to Israel is to order it from the book depository in, uh, in, in the UK, and their delivery is pretty quick, and the, uh -huh. the, the price is reasonable, and, and uh, uh, People I know have, have ordered it from them, and and, and uh, that's probably as, as quick as ordering it from anybody, and quick and no more expensive than ordering it from anybody in Israel. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Paula has a question or a comment. Yeah. I did. I couldn't type in the follow-up on that earlier good oh, source okay. part. So here's my question. Did the good source deliberately bring Rommel in? Was that a deliberate ruse or was it just fortuitous that it turned out so well? There was no um, allied plan to lure Rommel in. Um, as, as I said at the beginning, when Rommel reached El Alamein, as far as virtually everybody in the Middle East thought, he was on his way to, to victory. And not only in the Middle East, um, I'll get back to that in a moment. This, this was completely unplanned. And I would even add that the intelligence struggle was unknown even to the top British commanders in, in Egypt. The only one who had any idea of this problem with a good source was the RAF commander who'd been asked about certain leaked messages. Um, the, the British commanders knew that their intelligence was improving every day, that they were getting Rommel's messages quicker and quicker, but they did not know about the struggle to find and silence the good source. The result was that in the signal intelligence battle, the race to read the other side's information 
the balance in that struggle changed dramatically immediately before the Battle of El Alamein. At that point, the British not only silenced the good source, that's precisely when their ability to read German messages was improving dramatically. So you went from a situation where earlier in the in 1942, uh, you know, Rommel appeared to have this ESP about British plans to a situation where the British commanders were reading German messages a few hours after Rommel did. Uh, nobody intended that. In terms of the of the confidence on the German side, I just tell you that there's a message that was sent from the Japanese ambassador in Berlin who had very high access to Tokyo about his conversations with uh, Ribbentrop, the, the German uh, mm. foreign minister, in which he said, we're doing, we, we could have never expected this victory, which is almost in our hands. Um, the victorious German army is going to cut through Southern Russia and descend into Persia. Rommel is going to advance from Egypt and we're going to destroy the British empire in the Middle East. And they expected that by doing so, by the German forces reaching the Indian Ocean, that they would also finally be able to have direct contact with their Japanese ally. And that they would cut off the allied supply route that ran through Persia. They were completely confident of this. By the time that conversation had taken place, they had already lost the intelligence source that they needed to fight that battle. Just another tease, if I may, is there a Jewish connection here? Uh, the Jewish connection here is mainly in the effect that it had on us. Um, but not in the intelligence itself. No, there, there, okay. there were Jews working at Bletchley Park. Um, there's a very interesting uh, Jewish side to the American intelligence organizations going on at the same time, which I will tell you, which is, <clears throat> the British um, wisely had their, all of their signal intelligence in one agency. That was actually, what, that was also an, a, an accident of history. What happened is after World War I, neither the British Army nor the Navy wanted to pay for signal intelligence. So the Foreign Office took it over. And so everything was being done by one agency. In the United States, there was this competition between the Navy and the Army. And they, at many stages, didn't cooperate with each other. The interesting thing was, that the Navy codebreakers were all officers. Mm. The Army's codebreakers had been recruited through the civil service. Now, the civil service of the 20s and the 30s was racially segregated. Uh, uh, Woodrow Wilson had uh, racially segregated the federal uh, civil service. But on the other hand, it was one of the few places that Jews could get a job. If you mm. were a brilliant young mathematician who had finished university in the 1920s, academia didn't want you. For, by and large, um, but the civil service would hire you. So the original team of four code breakers who formed the core of the signal intelligence service of, of, the, um, of the US Army, three of them were Jewish. And wow. in, uh, soon after the United States entered the war, a top British officer named John Tiltman went to the United States to you know, coordinate with the Americans. And one of his jobs was supposed to be convincing the Americans that they had to end this division and that, you know, merge the army and the Navy agencies. And when he came back, he said, I'll never get them to cooperate. There's too much anti-Semitism in the Navy. They'll never work with those Jews from the army. Thank you. And thank you also for your earlier book, Zealots for Zion, which I had enjoyed you. I, I wish I could take credit for that, but that's not mine. Oh, it's not? Oh, I apologize. Nope. You don't have to apologize <gasps> to me. But <laughs> well, you wrote something similar then, and I don't remember what it, the title is. Henry, I see your microphone is open. Does that mean you have a question? Yeah, um, yeah I put a question in the uh, Q&A. You got it? Yeah. Oh, how come Turing gets all the credit and Ryuski and well, um, I don't know why Turing gets all the credit. I mean, there's one reason that Turing gets all the credit is that people were particularly aware of how he was persecuted and how that mm. 
it led to his early death. He, he was per persecuted for being a homosexual. Um, he was convicted of criminal sexual behavior in the early 50s and in lieu of going to prison, except some, accepted something called uh, chemical castration, which was hormone treatment to suppress yeah. his sexuality. Uh, he ended up committing suicide. He did so in a way that was supposed to look like accidental poisoning, um, which he did so that he could soften the blow to his mother. Um, and that, you know, uh, persecution certainly echoed afterwards. Second of all, besides his role at Lexi Park, Turing was responsible for the original theoretical work or one of the key original pieces of theoretical work that led to the computer age. He came up with the idea of a programmable machine. So that's led to his fame. Um, part of the reason that Ryusky was left out is that very, very few people, even at Bletchley Park, were aware of his role because GCHQ was so small at that time. And those people weren't around when the secret of breaking Enigma came out. So even Welchman himself did not know of Ryusky's role during the war and only found out about it 40 years later. So when the story was written in English, he basically got left out. And yet without his work, nothing that followed would have been possible. What he did was, was truly amazing. Thank you. Ms. Goldberg, your microphone is open. Uh, yeah, I just um, finished a book um, that's kind of a companion to this called um, Madame Forsad's Secret War, which is about the uh, French resistance. And it's a perfect complement to this because it's also oh. about code breaking and the radio operators. And, um, and there were, in this book, it's um, one branch of the French resistance. Oh. There were a number of Jews that were involved in various levels and, and someone named Kenneth Cohn from an M16 in London. So anyway, it's, it's perfect. I'm looking forward to reading this because it was um, very, they, they're compliments. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I think, unless there are other questions that I don't see. Well, then. Okay, I well, wanna... thank you everybody and uh, enjoy reading. And yes. I believe that that we're going to have this up recorded as well. Is that correct? I will, I will send everybody the recording who was Great. here if anybody wants. Um, and again, we greatly appreciate it. And I strongly recommend reading the book. <laughs> I don't always, I do. This right. one, it's, it's just a great read. So thank you so much. <laughs> so thank okay. you all for coming. And again, I apologize for the beginning, um, but we do look forward to seeing you at future events. Please check us out. Thank and you, Gershom. Thank you. Bye, Gershom. Thank you. Thank <clears> you. <throat>